Good late morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, once again, we are here uh, at the Center for the National Interest. My name is Harry Kazianis. I'm Director of Defense Studies here. We are also the publisher of the National Interest Magazine. That's how you're getting us. Uh, you're on our Facebook Live page, or you're watching us now on YouTube. So we're doing this in two different formats these days. Once again, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Danny Davis. He is a senior fellow at Defense Priorities, a great think tank here in Washington, D.C. that's doing some excellent work. And for once, Danny, we are going to move away from North Korea. We're we are going into a North Korea free zone today. Um, we are going to, I'm sure something will probably happen while we're while talking. We're here, yeah. you, you never know. <laughs> Kim Jong un could light off another missile, who knows? But we're going to talk about a, an equally important subject, and that is the, the, the state of play in Afghanistan right now. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot that's been happening over the last couple of years. Specifically, that the Taliban has been gaining more ground over, over the months and years. And there's an open question if the United States could have another surge in Afghanistan, what the policy of the Trump administration should be. So we're going to talk about that. So, Danny, I'm just going to go right to the obvious question. In a couple years, a couple months, will we see the Taliban fully control Afghanistan? Is that in the cards, and can we stop it? I, I don't think that it's in the cards for them to fully control Afghanistan, because frankly, r right now there's so many different uh, sects and so many different uh, you know, warlords and their own uh, fiefdoms. For example, this, uh, uh, the, uh, what was it called? The Petraeus, this famous uh, local Afghan local police, the mm -hmm. ALP. Mm -hmm. um, that had the product of training basically private militias for various warlords around so they can control their little area so it's not likely that the taliban will ever be able to completely control the country as they did before um not the least of which because you know the united states is helping the Kabul, <laughs> the Kabul mayor as, as some like to call the the president because right. that's all he's in control of right um so it's not going to completely fall it's not going to be like a saigon kind of a thing where you know the north vietnamese sweep in and then take over everything uh but it's going to remain in perpetual chaos for the foreseeable future so what can we do to stop it do we do, is there is there any i mean you've been in afghanistan you know this terrain how many times did you deploy to afghanistan yeah, I did, for, I deployed, for our viewers uh, twice okay. uh, in, in uniform and then i've uh, been one additional time uh, as a, in a private capacity okay so you have a lot of expertise in this what what should we do what would if you were talking to president trump what would you tell him to do? All right. Well, first of all, we need to back up just a little bit. Okay. As, as uh, most people know, there's a uh, plan on the table that says we should increase between three to 5,000 troops because General Nicholson said— How many said do we have right now? We just have 8,500, 8, something okay. like that. Okay. Uh, General Nicholson said, in uh, who's the commander of the Afghan force uh, in congressional testimony in February, that the situation has degenerated into a stalemate and that we have to have these additional troops to turn the tide back over there. But— Harry, I got to tell you, on the surface of it, it's it's something close to outright absurd, because if we could not have uh, turn the tide and bring the Taliban to their knees into the negotiating table, which is one of the stated intents of this this mini surge, as some are calling it, if we couldn't do it with 100,000 troops, what possible logic would someone suggest that 13,000 would do it? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it makes no sense at all. The Taliban have to be laughing about it. They withstood 140,000 of NATO's best troops for however many years and not only didn't go away, but have since risen to, you know, their strongest point since they were routed in 2001. So that's not going to work. It's not going to do anything. What it will do is it'll it'll ensure that Kabul doesn't fall, the mm -hmm. city of Kabul and the province. And is that possible? Is, 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 is Kabul actually in play right now? It's... <clears throat> I actually spoke with, with a member of the Mishrano Jirga, that's their sure. Senate, uh, uh, not long ago, and I, and I asked him that question, and I, and I thought it was a throwaway no, you know, of course that wouldn't happen. But he said for the first time in his life, he's, he's not sure that's not wow. possible. Wow. Um, he's not going out and saying it's going to, but the fact that he's even equivocating is really an indicator. And, and again, I don't think it's so much that the city would fall to, uh, you know, to a, an, an insurrection or whatever, but that it could collapse from within mm. and that and elements within Kabul could either ally with the Taliban or, or form together their own or, or some other kind of grouping. I mean, there's also not so much on the radar here, but one of the uh, governors in northern uh, Afghanistan, uh, I believe his name is uh, Noor uh, Ada, Muhammad Ada, or Nur Muhammad Ada, mm -hmm. one, probably the second most powerful man in Afghanistan, and he has amassed a large fortune, uh, a, a sizable militia, and and some suggest that that he may at some point either run for president or just take it if he can't get it because uh, 
he doesn't like what's going on there. So there's many things are at play, and none of them are good for stability. Interesting. So another question for you, not being a Middle East expert myself, so I, I want to try and dig down as much as I can. How much do the locals, at least from your perspective, support the Taliban. I mean, if they're if they're approaching, I think I don't have uh, the latest stats I saw is they don't they have something like 40% of the country under their control roughly. Why do the people support them? I mean, you hear these these terrible atrocities yeah. they've carried out. Why? They, they don't. That's then that's the real indicator of just how much the problem is and where it is. And okay. I'll touch on that in just a second. Sure. But I mean, from the very beginning, the first time that these uh, surveys were done, I think as early as 2002, 2003, something like that, uh, all the way through to the latest ones, the the uh, negative views of the Taliban have always been in the 90s, never below that. But so that tells you something. If they don't like the Taliban that much, then that means that they have to have an equal or possibly greater dislike of their own government. Otherwise, it would be easy to turn to them. If they thought, well, the government can help right. us and we don't like this, we'll turn to the government. But the government at so many levels has sometimes been predatory, especially with the police force, with the just justice system, with the corruption in terms of you can't get anything done without paying an exorbitant fee. Uh, they just have no confidence in the government. And, you know, they see warlords, you know, with terrible atrocity records now walking around in Kabul with great fanfare. Uh, they see others actually in the government have been for a long time that, that were uh, accused war criminals, you know. And so they say, what what chance do we have to have a government that will take care of us? Uh, you know, and they say at least the Taliban helps us in these areas here. We don't like them, but we don't like these guys even right. more. Right. Right. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's a real indicator. So that's one of the big problems to, to having any kind of political resolution is that the, the local government's not respected. Interesting. What role does opium production play? I, I've I've read a lot over the last couple of years that it's. It, I, I you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's one of the it is the biggest producer of opium. It's, it's largely exported throughout the world. Does that destabilize the country? Does that lead drug lords to try and take over parts of the country? How embedded are they with the Taliban? Talk a little bit about that because yeah. that's something that's that's fascinating. It's yeah, and and here's an amazing statistic. Uh, just before 9/11, in the year 2001. The Taliban had, a, had an edict, uh, a, a religious edict, that the opium and stuff was a sin and whatever, and they eradicated it from the country. Completely. I don't mean to diminish it. It was eradicated. Really? There was no crop in 2001 because they had an iron fist and shut it down wow. completely. Wow, wow. However, once the, once the Taliban fell in the first year or two, many farmers just started doing it again because it's the biggest cash crop and all yeah. they care about is you know what can make a subsistence for their family and then as the taliban started coming back they started co-opting all that and then protecting you know per, almost like a mafia kind of deal i'm going to protect you uh and they did and so now then after we put in i don't even know how many tens of billions of dollars in counter drug uh, operations the united nations you know uh, drug agency uh UN, UN doc i believe it's called they you know put lots of effort in there and all it did was grow so for all of our billions in, in effort, it, it has continued to grow. So the, the last year uh, was either the highest or one of the highest since 2001. Uh, and, of course, it is absolutely funding the Taliban because it's almost like their industry now. Amazing. So, Danny, let's cut to the chase. What, what can the United States do? Uh, is it is I mean, obviously, from listening to you, it's not your opinion is it's not worth putting in more troops. I understand that. What what? What can we reasonably do to help our, our Afghan partners? Yeah, and there's there's one other issue we got to touch on to answer that question. Please. So there's the one element is the Afghan government, and the second element is the support for the um, support for the insurgency at writ large in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So the Pakistani government is is well known. I mean, it's it's hardly even hidden. And I've talked to many of our diplomats who who said that uh, you know off camera that Pakistan uh, officials. We'll tell them, well, yes, of course we are, but why would we not? I mean, you, you don't give us any incentive to, because at some point you're going to leave, and there's all this chaos, and we're going to be left with it. So we're going to make sure that we have some ability to control that. And then alternative, or additionally, they're concerned about India. So uh, India has been you know, relatively friendly with the Kabul government, and so they regard with great suspicion anything India does in Afghanistan. So their fear is that at some point they could be surrounded you know, on both sides by Indian-friendly uh, 
uh, forces and whatever. So they want to make sure that they have a, a ace in the hole kind of thing in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. So as long as that stays and this stays, there is impossible. It wouldn't matter if we sent 200,000, 300,000 troops and said we're just going to dominate militarily. You, as long as you have your force on the ground, you can you can do that. But the minute that you pull it back, because these other things still exist, it's going to degenerate. So you have to solve these two problems. So my recommendation is that instead of sending in another 5,000 troops, which won't accomplish anything, is that let's let's just keep the situation stabilized for some period of time, but say, okay, and, and we'll just pick a number right now, five years. All right, Kabul government, you have five years to meet these strict benchmarks for uh, transparency and effective governance. And, and you, there's a number of things you can set. You have five years and then we're going to withdraw our support because it's you're on your own. So you have five years of time to prepare because you're going to be responsible for your security and everything else. Now, there's some things that you can continue to help out with, but in terms of the troops, in terms of our massive support, you're going to be on your own to get that done. Concurrently, then we start working heavy diplomatic uh, activity with, with Islamabad and say, okay, this is going on, and it's not. I'm not going to lose one more American troop to something that you're supporting over here. So it, it needs to be a combination of carrots and sticks, but there needs to be some carrots. Mm-hmm. Uh, too many times what we've said, we've tried to you know, use the, the strong arm on Pakistan and tell them, you have to do this, you have to do that, and we don't offer them anything, any, any motivation to want to do it. So if you don't use diplomat pressure here and, and some f- tough love here, then this thing will literally go on forever. We'll be here another 50 years, and it'll still not be stable, but at least Kabul won't fall, and that can't be in America's national interest. Fair enough. So I think we're going to leave it there. We're, I'm sure we're going to talk about the subject a lot more in the in the, the the weeks and months to come. Again, Danny Davis, he's a senior fellow at Defense Priorities. My name is Harry Kazianis with the Center for the National Interest. See you soon.